You are listening to Off the Shelf, a podcast by The Conference Board. Hello and welcome everyone to this episode of the Off the Shelf Bookcast, a podcast brought to you by The Conference Board. My name is JP Kuvein. I'm principal at Uber Brands Consulting, teach at Columbia University, and most important for this particular episode, I lead the Marketing Institute here at the Conference Board. Today, I'll be talking to Irvin Rambourg, who is Managing Director and Global Head of Consumer and Retail Equity Research at HSBC Bank, currently here in New York, previously in Hong Kong and all over the world. And most importantly, Irvin is the author of Future Lux, subtitled What's Ahead for the Business of Luxury. It's a book about the major forces and emerging trends that are set to reshape that luxury industry over the next decade or so, and that will be the subject of our conversation. Hello, Irvin. Thanks for coming, for joining us today. Where are you? I'm actually based in New York. I'm actually still working from home uh, today. All right. So we're almost neighbors, even though we're uh, an ether away here via the internet. <laughs> Thanks for welcoming me. Thanks for having well, me. I want to say at least one that your real name is Ervon Rambourg, right? But we'll Americanize and bastardize the whole thing for ease. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to get it done at least once. Thank you. Irvin knows what he's writing and talking about uh, when it comes to luxury. And that's not only because he's French, as you might have heard from a little accent there. Uh, so luxury uh, comes uh, kind of naturally to him. But he's also an expert uh, because he's, he's been analyzing it for um, his bank, HSBC, for some 15 odd years or so. And what I particularly like is he's also been a practitioner in the field of managing and marketing luxury brands, having worked previously for groups like Richemont or LVMH or Moet NC Louis Vuitton is the long version, uh, which are obviously uh, two of the biggest luxury groups in the world. He's been based in France, in Hong Kong, in New York, which means that we're going to get a, a, a good deep perspective, broad perspective from both a practitioner as well as somebody who can step back and look uh, at this industry through the eyes of, of a, a financial expert. Irvin has written a book previously that was entitled The Bling Dynasty uh, while he was in Hong Kong. Uh, and that was all about the reign of the Chinese luxury shopper. And at the time, he said that reign had only just begun I think we'll find in this conversation that it continues to drive the growth in the industry. So I'm looking forward to getting a little bit from that first book at, as well. So anyway, with that, thanks again, uh, Irvin, for joining us. Let's dive right in if you're ready. Absolutely. Pleasure. I said in the intro that, that you're an expert when it comes to luxury. Uh, for a lot of people, uh, you know, the first thing that comes to their head or should at least, is what do we even mean when we talk about luxury? Because it means different things to different people. So can you give us kind of your definition of luxury when you think, analyze, and write about it? Yeah, I think, I mean, that's a, a quasi-philosophical question, and I might need a third, uh, much broader book to try to answer it. Uh, <laughs> what I would say is what I've been focusing on is essentially personal guilt, um, so wearables to a certain extent. But I think uh, one element of the book is also to say that over the next decade, you'll have a, a tremendous change in terms of consumption, uh, a lot of change also in the corporate world and in distribution. So you will probably come to the point of redefining what luxury actually is. And to a certain extent, um, you know, luxury 15, 20 years ago was the reality of scarcity. I think today that reality is uh, difficult to find. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's unlikely that many of the brands we'll be talking about actually have proper scarcity of product. Um, I think luxury more in terms of what is not needed, but uh, still very necessary. I, for me, luxury goods is what puts a smile on your face. It's what enables you to fit into society. It's what enables you to escape your daily routine. Again, it's a series of products or experiences that you can do without, but 
my God, what a pity it would be to do without them in, in a life that's so short. So for me, it's, um, it's really about escapism. It's really about, again, products uh, and experiences that you're ready to pay up for to uh, aspire to live a, you know, a, a rounder, better, greater life. Excellent. Well, I, I think you, you, you got us at least two of the somewhat common definitions or, or agreed on definitions, if you like. So on the one, there is something that I guess people call the classic luxury, which, like you say, it's all about those precious materials, provenance and, and the idea of scarcity uh, or even extreme scarcity. And then there's this other aspect of, you know, being totally discretionary, being l'art pour l'art, as they say sometimes, you know, just because you like it or you want it, but it really doesn't have, there's no functional need, utilitarian need behind it. Mm -hmm. Wolfgang Schäfer and myself, we've also written about modern prestige, and we talk there about brands that have meaning that goes beyond the material. So... A mm -hmm. car that is not just a car for you, a handbag that's not just something to transport your items. Mm -hmm. Does that ring true for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think uh, we are still in an initial phase of recruitment. You know, you were uh, mentioning my first book called The Bling Dynasty, which was uh, about the future of Chinese luxury consumption. And to your point, it is true that we are still in the infancy of growth with the Chinese consumer. In the initial phase of discovery, if I can say, you're going after a logo, a product, a brand. You are buying for others to accept you. You're buying to try to be accepted by your family members, your coworkers. You're hoping it'll help you obtain a promotion with your employer. So it's more about you know impressing people around you. But as you move from uh, the initial, you know, the sort of first time purchase to becoming a repeat purchaser, then indeed you're moving away from product and logo and brand to values and purpose. And I think that's when you get hooked. That's when you develop a more intimate relationship with the brand. That's when it becomes very emotional and you, you make the brand part of your personal history at that stage. Right. Um, so, you know, I think the initial The initial point is essentially social validation, uh, but very rapidly as you move on, as you become more wealthy, more traveled, more sophisticated, it becomes a more personal experience. Right. So there again, luxury here as, as a, you know, stages, stages you go through. What's luxury to one person, other people have already moved on from and, and consider other things luxury. So let's dive into your latest book, which, which just came out. It has a three parts to it. And in the first one, you talk about the luxury consumer. And consumers are also something that interests us a lot, uh, interests us a lot here at the Marketing and Communication Center. Um, if I was to summarize, maybe amalgamate kind of the profile you're painting of that um, new luxury consumer, I would say something like she's young, she's part of the middle class or rising middle class if you're in China. And then if I extend it from just China to the other luxury key markets, which are probably Japan, US, Europe, um, I would add that, you know, she's from a diverse racial background, uh, probably particular when you talk about the US and maybe Europe. I don't think that that portrayal will surprise a lot of people that work in marketing, even on mass marketing products. However, I always wonder when that comes forward, what about the fact that, particularly in luxury, I think about 60 to 80 percent of discretionary spending, so of income for these companies, actually comes from the older generations, Gen X and boomers in particular. Mm. Should we just forget about them? What's their role? Or is it bad form to talk to them or about them? No, I, um, we shouldn't forget about them. Uh, what, what I would point to, however, is the the percentages are probably going to evolve uh, pretty quickly. I, I think if you look at so-called digital natives, uh, you know, they accounted for about nine percent of global population in 2016, and will account for up to 30 percent by 2030. So, so I think things are evolving very quickly. But uh, it's a very good question because for me. There was a point in time, probably 15, 20 years ago, 
when daughters would look up to their moms to get cues on what what's hot, what's not, what's fashionable, what should I wear. And I think that relationship has flipped. You know, I think to a certain extent, the moms are looking at their daughters thinking, okay, what's cool? What are you, you know, following on TikTok or Snap or uh, Instagram or whatever else that I should get inspiration from? So to a certain extent, it's, you know, it's not the 20-year-old aspiring to what the 40-year-old is wearing. It's more the other way around. And I think the, the influence of this young generation is becoming pretty uh, phenomenal. Let me just interrupt you here for one in-between question, which is mm -hmm. I understand the influence part and the influence on trends and trend setting and also on communication and being more agile and faster with social media. But what about the spending power? Because I hear also that on a macroeconomic level, this generation of youth is the first one in a long time in the mature markets that seems to or that will have less purchasing power mm -hmm. than the previous generation. How do we square that up with luxury growth? Well, I mean, the, I, I might shock you by saying this, but I don't think uh, luxury uh, consumption is actually that correlated to financial means. I think it's more correlated to psychology. So if you're a young up and coming 22 year old lady in China and you're getting your first paycheck, the place of luxury in your life is actually quite dominant. Uh, and so you'll be ready to cut on quite a few other expenses, again, because you believe that this will enable you to move forward. Um, you know, four or five years ago, you had a lot of people in the media or other observers of luxury thinking the young generation won't have an interest for luxury. They'll be interested by experiences. Uh, and so the brands will struggle. It's the exact reverse that happened. Uh, to your point, you know, a lot of young people don't necessarily have phenomenal financial means. But again, because they spend eight to 10 hours on their phones, because they post uh, pictures or, or, or videos of themselves, the brands that they're wearing, the image that they want people to perceive is key. Uh, and so you know, actually, quite surprisingly, youth um, and not necessarily just uber wealthy youth uh, has been driving uh, growth in luxury uh, in recent times. That, that, that seems to make sense uh, to me, absolutely. I remember, I recall my assistant in Hong Kong literally spending probably four to six months worth of income on a single handbag, but then she lived at home and her mom cooked her lunch to take along to the office every day. So um, You have to get your priorities right, I guess. Yeah. Right, you need, you need to get your priorities right. Now, let's... Moving from Asia to U.S. and Europe, question, are those markets doomed to be stagnant? Should we really only talk about China or isn't the U.S. market, for example, still one of the backbones of this industry? No, I actually think about the U.S. market as a, as a core emerging market for luxury. I mean, there is, you were talking about wealth. I mean, there's a phenomenal gap between wealth in the U.S. and spending on luxury for reasons that are more cultural, uh, you know, for reasons linked historically to the guilt factor, you know, this idea that it's inappropriate or vulgar to spend on labels in the US, um, for, you know, questions linked to a bit of a value for money skew of the American consumer. You know, this is the, this is the market where you're supposed to get a deal. This is the market of outlets, of refillable Coke, of all you can eat menus, et cetera, et cetera. So, You know, the, the concept of paying up for a brand is a bit awkward <laughs> uh, in the, the American psychology, but it's starting to shift. You know, it's starting to shift with a younger generation, with a more diverse generation. Um, if you remember, you know, the first ads of uh, Louis Vuitton that were specifically targeting the American consumer, they were with J-Lo uh, in 2003. Uh, and that was not a surprise if you look at, uh, um, you know, the ads as well. In terms of Hennessy, they were also targeting the African-American community. Um, so I think you're starting to see a, a, a pretty uh, important shift. Uh, and I, I believe that the U.S., I mean, the U.S. recently has rebounded quite surprisingly, but I believe growth has legs here. Interesting. Very interesting. Let's cover a last subject before we move on from the consumer, which is this gender and ethnic aspect that preoccupies marketers so much in the mass market. How do you think that plays out in a market like in the US? Uh, is it going to be uh, equality there as well in luxury or is luxury somehow less diverse, let's put it like that? No, I, I think what you've seen is, you know, there are a lot of reports showing that the, the Hispanic community uh, tend to spend more. 
uh, on premium items. And that's, you know, pretty much across the board, whether it's uh, uh, premium spirits or footwear or jewelry or handbags and accessories. There is clearly, again, this, this appetite for fitting in and this appetite for expressing yourself. And I think, again, the young generation doesn't really have uh, the guilt factor. I mean, we, we've actually seen evidence of a lot of recruitment going on uh, counterintuitively starting this summer uh, in the US. You know, you've had companies mentioning they were recruiting uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, first time purchasers to their brand here in the US. Um, I think w- one implication is, um, you know, diversity and inclusion roles uh, and management teams, uh, notably here. Um, in America being a better reflection of the communities they're selling to. That's a that's an important change I see uh, coming. Okay, so that, that sounds though pretty much in line with the rest of the industry. Um, let, let's move to part two of your book. You talk there about the quote unquote sellers, which means the manufacturers, the retailers that have to do with uh, luxury, maybe also the ad agencies. And you point out that a competitive advantage of those big luxury groups you've been part of yourself is that they control kind of the uh, vertical value chain from the first, the skins and so on through the atelier and then their own shops and maybe new trend in the future, also the handling of secondhand and, and repair of their items. Mm-hmm. Can you tell our listeners a bit why you think that's a particular advantage in this sector and why would it be different for for other manufacturers or brand owners we should say i don't know if it's an advantage i think it comes with the territory i think it's almost an obligation i mean you are charging pretty high prices and you are oftentimes run by family members who you know even though most of the companies that i look at are listed on the stock market uh, they don't really care about the next quarter or the next year in terms of profits or sales they care about you know, brand equity building and will my, will my brand name still be in the bright lights in 20 years from now as I pass it on to the next generation? So control helps. You know, if you control fully your production, uh, your supply chain, if you control as much as you can your distribution, uh, obviously you're minimizing the risk of damage to brand equity in terms of either, you know, uh, products being produced uh, inappropriately or, uh, you know, products being discounted uh, if you're with the wrong retailers. So th- there is a slight discrepancy between the, the French and the Italian model. You know, uh, French uh, companies tend to be more integrated vertically in terms of distribution, uh, whereas Italian companies tend to rely on, you know, very close partners, but uh, third party partners for production. Uh, but I think for distribution, if you can, and you know, not every single subsector is adapted to this, but if you can, you want to control as much as possible. Right. Interesting. It, it reminds me of a discussion I had just yesterday at Columbia um, about family enterprises. And mm-hmm. we said that those family controlled companies, like you described it a little bit, think of the Chanel's or the Hermes's of this world, you know, can invest into the future, can invest in a strong equity can avoid driving discounts in order to meet the quarterly numbers for the analysts like yourself and so on and so on. (laughs) But then I got a remark by somebody in the audience, which was interesting. They said, well, I understand that for like, like, let's say an Hermes, Mm -hmm. but isn't LVMH really just a huge soulless juggernaut? (laughs) Um, I don't see... uh, Mr. Arnaud as the kind of craftsman or artisan, you know, that cares so much about his companies more so than a cold investor. What's your perspective on that? I mean, anecdotally, and this is, um, you know, when when LVMH announced that they were bidding for Tiffany initially, um, they made a presentation and they said, you know, what we will bring to Tiffany is the long term view uh, because the issue for Tiffany is it's a listed company. And so it's under scrutiny on a quarterly basis. And that's hilarious because LVMH itself is a listed company. But they were just saying to the market, you know, again, we don't care about the short term. So I think, you know, there's always this term of uh, combination of logic and magic. Uh, I think 
Bernard Arnault is not just cold-blooded. I think he's a phenomenal financier, uh, and I think he's a great visionary, but he's got a lot of emotions. You know, when it comes to Vuitton, when it comes to Dior, and soon uh, as Tiffany becomes part of the group, uh, when it comes to Tiffany and other assets that he's running, I really think that he is moved uh, by uh, creativity, by design, uh, by the, the, you know, he's obviously moved by the real, you know, the only guidance they have at LVMH is to gain market share. And to be fair, they've right. uh, they've been delivering on that. But it's not just about a cold financial approach. I think there's a lot of emotion uh, going on in in the brand building at LVMH. Hmm. In your book, you say that this kind of scaling that obviously Bernard Arnault is the best at. He is not one of the richest men in the world for nothing mm -hmm. it is going to continue. And I think you, you kind of foresee further consolidation of, uh, you know, these smaller family luxury mm -hmm. brands. Don't you think there is linked to that also ultimately a risk of bursting the bubble that people look behind the scenes and see that, no, they're not buying a little piece of artistry or artisanship. Yeah, they're buying, you know, a branded piece from a huge conglomerate that rivals, you know, the Googles, the, the IBMs or the Facebooks of this world. Yeah. Um, so I, I would say two things to that. I, I think probably the vast majority of consumers who are buying, you know, Fendi, Celine, whatever, probably don't know that it's part of LVMH. Similarly, if you're buying Bottega or Saint Laurent or Gucci, you're probably not aware that it's part of a big group. But You know, I, I would say more importantly, the, the big risk that we saw in the space six, seven years ago was a risk of ubiquity and a risk of, to your point, brands becoming too big and consumers being fed up. And to be honest, when I was based in Hong Kong six, seven years ago, I did get the comment from a lot of Chinese consumers who were um, visiting from the mainland that they were, you know, they were fed up with Vuitton. They had seen it too much. It had become a brand for secretaries. Vuitton now is twice the size. I haven't heard that comment in four years. You know, they've done a phenomenal job in terms of hyper segmenting the product offering, the uh, experience within the stores, the communication um, to give you, again, the illusion of scarcity. You know, I, I, I guess... Luxury, very few, uh, with very few exceptions, is not about scarcity. It's about giving you the illusion of scarcity, making you believe that when you're buying that Vuitton handbag, you're the only one, even though you're one in millions. Right, right. It reminds me, actually, when I worked for Procter Gamble, and we always said, you know, fortunately, nobody knows that, you know, your toilet paper, your diaper, your cooking oil at the at that time, at least, and your face cream are all coming from the same <laughs> um, from the same group. Right. You have a hopeful message, at least at first read, about retail and physical brick and mortar, as it's called here, retail in particular. So I, I, I want to dive into that. But before we do that, we'll just take a little break for some quick announcements by the conference board, and we'll see you on the other side. Excellent. Can you, your team, or your company benefit from insights such as the ones provided in this podcast? They are immediately available when you join the Conference Board, a membership-based think tank that delivers trusted insights for what's ahead. Reaching across industries and geographies, we bring together our noted experts, senior executives from the world's largest companies, and nonpartisan practical research to help you address your most important business issues. Our membership packages are tailored to your organization's unique needs and budget. To learn more about our offerings, go to www.conferenceboard.org and click join on the top bar to connect with one of our product specialists. Well, hello and welcome back to my conversation here with Irvin Rambourg, who is the author of the book Future Lux. And just before the break, I was talking about a hopeful message for brick and mortar physical retail and maybe other physical brand experiences. But at the same time, I think, uh, Irvin, you, you'll say you're not necessarily talking about the Macy's, Neiman Marcus's or Barney's of this world. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. I'm, I'm more talking about, uh, you know, destination stores, uh, specialty stores. Uh, I'm talking about um, the reality that when the world reopens, uh, because we're still in a recruitment phase of the industry, Many newcomers to luxury will want their first purchase to be in a uh, in a brick and mortar, in a physical 
environment. I think um, you know if you're Nike or if you're a cosmetics company and you tell me you know half of my sales are online and will be uh, for the foreseeable future, that's fine. Uh, but if you're a premium European luxury company uh, and you say the same, well, either you're not really a premium European uh, luxury company or you're taking risks. And to be fair, because recruitment again is key, my first experience, if I'm in the market of my first branded handbag, and there's a lot of storytelling between brands and consumers, but the more important storytelling is amongst consumers themselves. I don't want to be telling my buddy or my girlfriend, you know, for my first branded handbag purchase, I basically browsed on a website, I clicked twice, and I received the goods after two days. You know, that's not a story. That's incredibly boring. So I think brick and mortar has an essential role to play. Uh, obviously, the store of tomorrow will have uh, nothing to do with the store of today because, again, you need to look at hyper segmentation. You need to look at differentiation uh, by city, even by neighborhood. You need to have a reason to actually get out of your home and go to that store specifically. Uh, and you need to you know, remember uh, that experience uh, and not get confused by you know, thinking that you could have been anywhere. So I think there's a, there's a need of a huge differentiation uh, between the stores that are uh, set up globally. Right. So you are envisioning kind of a revival, but a more differentiated and artistic revival of what was called the experience economy. So it's not just a store. It is a place where a story is being created for you, a story that you can pass on, that you can talk about, that you can tweet, Instagram, whatever the social media will be at the time. And it kind of provides background and depth to your symbolic purchase, whether it's the handbag or the luxury car. Yeah, I mean, you, you again, if you're young, if you're uh, female, if you're Asian, uh, which again, you know, is not 100% of the market, but uh, what's really moving the market today, you're looking for entertainment, right. you're looking for education, you know, you're looking to, to learn and to exchange with a, a human being. Um, and you are looking to be surprised uh, and delighted by what you're seeing, hearing, tasting, right. uh, smelling. Right. So, um, you know, I, I think, again, it's, um, it's a sort of holistic uh, experience that you're going after. And it's certainly the opposite of deja vu. You know, right. I want to be surprised. You know, right. I want to. No, no, we're, 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 we're also talking about more of the entry point here of luxury, right? When we, when we turn to, let's say, the $500,000 car, the $10 million yacht, the $100 million apartment, and so on then this experience will not play in a store, right? It will be about a service experience, yeah. about a personalized experience, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't need to take place in a store. It could take place in your mansion in the Hamptons, you know, if, uh, if that's, where you, uh, <laughs> that's where you're at. I, it's just this idea that, you know, I need to be entertained. I need to be surprised. I right. need someone to have a drink with and who will, you know, uh, tell me a story. And, you know, that will make me a lot more comfortable. So, again, you're right. I mean, it doesn't have to be in the sort of traditional, you know, Fifth Avenue, Madison Avenue store necessarily, depending right. on your means. <laughs> right, right. Now, um, in the future of luxury, which is the last part of your book, one of your hypotheses is that everything can be premiumized. Everything can be... Uh, made a luxury. You talk about the democratization of luxury. And we've seen, obviously, you know, a jar of salt can be anything from $2.99 to $30 if it's just Fleur de Sel de la Guérande. <laughs> yeah. But, um, I mean, how, how, how is it going to be different in 2025? I isn't, it, isn't there rather a risk of luxury inflation, at least by name, it seems like to me, everything's a luxury by now. Yeah, I mean, um, 2025 is, is an interesting um, sort of milestone, because I think that might be the tipping point between, again, a recruitment industry right now. So with a lot of newcomers, a lot of first time purchasers, and by 2025, you might see the tipping point where you move from a sector essentially driven by recruitment to a sector uh, driven by repeat purchases. And when that happens, that's when you see the uh, the risk of substitutes emerging. And the substitutes, to your point, can be anything from a, a super expensive jar of salt 
to travel, uh, you know, obviously a bit counterintuitive given uh, what we were going through today, to cannabis, to uh, health and wellness, to, you know, you, it's endless the, the, the amount of subsectors that can actually target uh, your wallet uh, instead of you buying a third or fourth or fifth uh, uh, small leather product. And actually, uh, if you look at LVMH uh, prior to the Tiffany acquisition, the, the previous two acquisitions were not in sort of plain vanilla luxury. You know, they bought the German premium luggage manufacturer Remova. Uh, they bought the hospitality chain Belmont. Now, in hindsight, you might say, well, you know, that timing was awful because it was pre-COVID uh, and pre-basically the world shutting down. But the reality is it was probably the role and it still probably is the role of LVMH to define what luxury will be next. And so they're looking at subsectors that can indeed target your wallet as a uh, a wealthy consumer away from the traditional you know products that we all know in terms of handbags, jewelry, watches, and the like. All right. Um, in that in that last part, you also talk about a trend which we're seeing clearly uh, right now, which is that youth seems to be more aware, even more demanding of environmental sustainability, social justice, fair wages etc., particularly in an increasing kind of polarized political environment as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and you say that the luxury industry needs to kind of um, navigate that, if not get involved. Yeah. How does that work? I mean, isn't luxury a little bit about, you know, I have the cake and you can't eat it? <laughs> isn't it a little bit about the arrogance of exclusivity, etc.? If we're too embracing, if we come the ben, ben and Jerry's kind of luxury of everyone's equal, does it not do away with some of the appeal of at least we are different from you if it's a group of people? Yeah, um, so I, I think that's a very interesting uh, theoretical marketing position. You know, if you look at jewelry, for example, there's a very interesting tension right now between uh, Tiffany, which is seen as New York inclusive, and Cartier, which is known to be king of jewelers, jeweler to the kings. The reality uh, is somewhat different, i.e. the reality of what they sell. You know, if you look at what Cartier and Tiffany sell in China, for example, it's pretty much adjacent, you know, in terms of price points, uh, in terms of quality, uh, in terms of merchandising and the like. So, Uh, you're looking at companies that are incentivized, again, to uh, recruit more individuals uh, and are incentivized to give you the, uh, again, the illusion of scarcity. So uh, I think, uh, you know, it's it's more democratic. Uh, you know, I'm not saying it's cheap, uh, it's, but it's, it is more embracing and democratic than what people would think um, initially. The, the other thing about that question is, I think it's quite important to convey the message, especially uh, given the times we've been uh, going through, that you get it, you know, that you're a good corporate citizen, that you understand what consumers have just gone through, that you give back to communities. Um, and I think outside the luxury industry, Nike has done this tremendously well, dominating, uh, you know, the, the conversation around the BLM uh, movement here in the US. Um, I think uh, during the, the peak of the crisis, A lot of luxury brands have also come across as being great corporate citizens, either by repurposing production sites to, you know, to produce hand sanitizers or PPE, uh, giving to charity, building hospitals in Milan like uh, Montclair did it. And, you know, I got a lot of questions from investors asking me, why on earth are they doing that? Well, they're doing that because the mission of luxury is to capture the cultural zeitgeist. And if you're selling to a community that is going through a rough patch, you have to convey the message that you're not isolated in an ivory tower, not thinking about who you're selling to. Right. You, right. you have to convey the message that you get it. I would argue that the important point, though, is also that, you know, Louis, Louis Vuitton, the group at least, did, uh, you know, hand sanitizer and so on. But importantly, they did not, you know, they did not start to sell those hand sanitizers at $90 in a leather, <laughs> you know, bottle or whatever. And they moved on for example, then doing a virtual fashion show to continue on their theme of the yeah. eternal mystical journey, the epic journey. Uh, so they continue to brand build and not just get distracted by now becoming PPE manufacturers, right? Yeah, sure, sure. But it's, but it's just this idea that you, again, you, you know, the brand becomes a person and right. there's, a, there's a dialogue going on and there's a certain level of intimacy 
an emotional tie. And it's difficult to be emotional and intimate if you ignore the problems that your consumers right. are going through. Right, right. That makes sense. Well, you know, time is running out when you're having fun, as they say. <laughs> so we're coming to the end here. But I wanted to ask you, you, had, you have a couple of other uh, trends for the future of luxury in the book, which we won't talk about. So people need to buy your book. That's my pitch for you. But <laughs> I have one area that's of general interest, and that is that of health and wellness. And a lot of people are talking about, you know, luxury of the future. Well, it has already arrived. It's in those wonderful spas and it's, it's mm -hmm. in that getaway, et cetera. Then it becomes a little bit more interesting from an ethical, philosophical perspective when you say it's private islands mm -hmm. where you have huge parties even during a pandemic because everyone got a test that's maybe not easily available to everyone and it's far away and you don't suffer any of the pollution or other distractions, environmental or health that the normal people have. It, it might make people start thinking Uh, I'm talking about the parties of the Kardashians, for example, of course. Right. So this is reality. And some people, like Yuval Hariri, for example, a, a historian and philosopher, you know, talks about the future definition of rich and privileged might be that it is those people who become immortal, right. meaning they can afford these incredible technological advances in biotechnology, in cyber technology, and other that make them maybe not immortal, but make them amortal, meaning maybe they can go on for 200 years or so. Um, do you see a maybe turning back to the times where luxury really becomes something that is almost upsettingly differentiating, like some people live twice as long as others because they can? I mean, I, I would certainly say that, that, that that's, a, that's a really good question. I would certainly say that under COVID-19, you've had uh, you know, people across the globe looking at the fact that potentially their employer and potentially the, the state they're living in will not protect them. And certainly health has become a phenomenal focus. And I talk about the, the trinity of health in the book, which is basically uh, exercising, eating healthy food, and sleeping. Um, I guess most people forget the last part. But what I would say is uh, becoming amortal. To be fair, I find that incredibly depressing. And, and I would just go back to one quote from Mae West, which is that you only live once, uh, but if you do it right, once is enough. Uh, <laughs> and for me, luxury really uh, gives you access to uh, exceptional you know, memories and exceptional uh, um, experiences and products. Uh, and honestly, the idea that you will expand your uh, life expectancy from 80 or 100 years to 200, I, I personally find that a bit depressing. I, I think life is short, make the most of it. And uh, whatever happens, we're all going to disappear eventually. Uh, so enjoy it while it lasts. Well, let, let's, uh, let's finish on that, on that somewhat upbeat note. <laughs> um, But uh, I think the, the enjoyment in luxury and the fact, uh, I think that was a nice insight from your side that it's not necessarily correlating with income levels and it's not necessarily meaning that you have to be a millionaire mm -hmm. um, is probably the part of luxury that we can all look forward to, particularly as we think of Christmas and coming out of this crisis. So let's keep it at that for now. Irvin, if people want to find out more about your thinking, your books, your analysis, what's the one place where they should go to find out about that? Well, I think you should go to the bookstore to, to have independent bookstores survive. And if, if you don't feel that way and you're not allergic to it, you can go on Amazon as well to find out more. Uh, but there are a lot of local bookstores in your neighborhoods that can order the book. And, uh, and obviously, you can contact me uh, by uh, a lot of different means, be it you know, LinkedIn or email or whatever else. All right. Well, I like that. I like that pitch for the independent <laughs> bookstore. Let, let's do that. And um, so thanks again, uh, Irvin. And um, thanks to you, dear listener. Thank you for tuning in. If you found this episode interesting, helpful, insightful, uplifting, entertaining, i.e. a luxury, as Irvin calls it, then don't be shy. Let us know about it. Comment, rate, and so on. You know the drill. Tell all your neighbors, friends, and family about it. And uh, find other off-the-shelf offerings and other podcasts by the conference board at 
www.conference-board.org forward slash podcast. And with that, I say thanks again, Irvin. Thank you. And goodbye, au revoir, auf Wiedersehen. See you next time. Cheers. This has been Off the Shelf, a podcast by The Conference Board.